Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce a disruptive innovator, I think I could say. I don't think you're a lone nutter, although you probably felt a little bit of a lone nutter um, at the time. Um, my colleague and friend Ingrid Plukan is the um, smoking cessation support nurse at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne and the pa also a patient services manager. Ingrid uh, led Peter Mac, uh, not alone, but certainly at the forefront um, and was the disruptive innovator to become the first totally smoke-free metropolitan hospital in 2007 in, in Victoria. You might have thought that a cancer centre might have been smoke-free, but in fact there was a lot of mythology about needing to let people who had cancer smoke because uh, it was the last uh, pleasure kind of they had. Uh, Ingrid had uh, worked in lung cancer for a long time, had been instrumental as a a clinician in many of the adverts that you've seen um, on TV um, that were Victorian-led campaigns with um, patients, that, you know, the, the little girl climbing on the bed and saying, you should have been there, Dad. Um, that was work that Ingrid did in her life over here, and over here she had her clinical life, and the two things didn't match together. And how did you, how do you take the innovation that Ingrid was showing in her work with the Cancer Council and bring that into the clinic? And that was exactly what we um, facilitated Ingrid to be able to do by just giving her a little bit of money. Um, and she established the nurse-led smoking cessation clinic at Peter Mac, where she provides quit smoking strategies to a stream of cancer patients, family members and staff. And she's been recognised for this work with a high commendation from the Victorian Public Health Care Awards in 2006. Um, and also with the Jen Rusden Memorial Award for Service to Cancer Nursing and Commitment to Patient Care. And um, Ingrid's continued um, to lead in this area. Uh, and I, I think that given the Surgeon General this year repeated the 50 year, uh, 50 year anniversary of the Surgeon General's report on smoking in the US, which for the first time contains recommendations for the implementation or for the smoking cessation reduction in people after a diagnosis of cancer. And really, Ingrid's here today to talk about her work, um, uh, hopefully, as a call to action for you in your health services. So please welcome Ingrid. So <clears throat> I do have the Victorian Lurgy, so I hope I can croak my way through this presentation, so sorry about that. Thank you for inviting um, me to speak at your conference today and the warm welcome to country by um, Uncle Alan. Thank you very much. I hope I do justice um, to a rich and interesting agenda that's been planned by the conference committee by sharing how Peter Mac became a smoke-free hospital with a patient-focused, evidence-based smoking cessation clinic and the patient focus being the core value that we wanted to purport. So what is innovation? We look at identifying unmet needs and exploring how to address those needs. It's really important to use evidence-based practice and knowledge um, in your focus of this. And then you can start to think about a differing approach to what's actually been happening. What's, what is the standard? Well, how do you want to change it? More importantly, does this have an impact on patient care and the outcome of the patient? So the approach we used at Peter Mac to be a smoke-free hospital was from a patient perspective. And it was very much driven by identifying what the unmet needs were of our patient population. And we initially focused on patients with a smoking-related cancer, and when I was the um, unit manager of the lung cancer unit at Peter Mac, we certainly had patients that had unmet needs. So how do we explore those needs? We scrutinised what was already in place, and there really wasn't much in place. But how were other health services doing and addressing this issue? What was working? What was succeeding? What was failing? We then looked at the evidence to support the processes and we examined the literature. What works? What research had been done? What were the results? And why did those results occur? So we then wanted to use a differing approach that other health services had put into place. A lot of health services were starting to put in more of a punitive, you shall not smoke at this hospital, but really not doing else, anything else about it. If it wasn't working and it wasn't successful at a lot of hospitals, why? Who are the key stakeholders that are necessary? And we talked about getting those collective people who really buy into this notion of what we can do. 
What are our organisational values and aims and strengths and what are our limitations? Collaboration and leadership was to underpin our efforts and they continue to do so. This was to be the fundamental issue, that whatever we did was to be patient focused. It was found to be and is appropriate, acceptable, and it has to be feasible to your patient population. And subsequently this has actually led to the success of our program. So today's presentation will focus on how Peter Mac became a smoke-free hospital whilst maintaining a patient-centred support approach and using best practice smoking cessation strategies for the patient with cancer. So a few years ago in our lung cancer patient inpatient units, patients were actually initiating and requesting support to quit smoking. There is, as you know, significant guilt and stigma and nihilism by health professionals borne by patients with a smoking-related cancer. So we were very cognizant of this sensitivity. And the unit had no clinical expertise to assist patients to quit or even deal with a nicotine-dependent patient who was going through nicotine withdrawal in our hospital. So we went to the experts. <coughs> we liaised with Quit Victoria and made a proposal for educating nurses in some basic evidence-based smoking cessation strategies on the unit. So how did we do this? We did a training needs analysis with our nurses and an education program was developed just on the ward and implemented to nurses on the ward. And patients who requested to assist and they needed to self-refer because we were concerned we would offend them if we asked them about their smoking, were then offered brief patient intervention <clears throat> and then we referred them furthermore to the quit line for further support. So, Whenever you do any quality activity as such, <clears throat> you need to evaluate it. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the follow-up of the quit nurses found that it was very person dependent. There was a variance of how people interpreted the information and the support offered to patients. There was ambivalence amongst the staff as to the purpose of quitting particularly with a lung cancer diagnosis, were we actually doing the patients any favour? Quit referrals were also inconsistent and clearly we had more work to do. So at the time, <coughs> Peter Mack, in conjunction with the University of Melbourne, were offering clinical research fellowships to clinicians who had unanswered questions in our practice. So our team applied for and was given paid time and supported by nurse researchers, we were able to conduct a very strong literature review, and then we were able to recommend an implementation strategy. So our question at the time was, does continued smoking <clears throat> when a patient has a lung or a head and neck cancer diagnosis, does it have an impact on their cancer outcome? And what we found was that despite the significant and well-documented role of smoking in the development of cancer, cancer patients were actually a very much a neglected population in smoking cessation. Quitting smoking had low priority, not only for patients, but also for health clinicians. There were many competing issues and increased life stresses at the time of diagnosis. They were more centred on finding out what the scans were, what the stage of their disease was, and smoking cessation was really on the low priority. But we also found when we looked at our review that cancer patients suffered significant health consequences from smoking including the risks of cardiovascular and respiratory events. And we also know that there are more and more cancer survivors. So quality of life and health overall, we found was affected by continued smoking. So <clears throat> our review of our literature found several benefits when a patient with cancer stops smoking. They have decreased treatment complications, improved rates of complete response to treatment, less tumour resistance to cancer treatment, improved survival and relapse-free survival, reduced rates of metastases, decreased second primary tumour rate, less aggravated weight loss, improved surgical and anaesthetic outcomes, improved pain control, reduced infection rates, increased opportunities, therefore, to complete their anti-cancer treatment. They were actually healthier during their cancer treatment. Notably, also, we found that a cancer diagnosis is actually an opportunity for behavioural change. We looked at the behaviours around when a person has a new diagnosis of cancer. It presents, it presents that teachable moment when patients are willing to modify their behaviours and their lifestyles 
and are motivated to quit smoking. The literature also informed us that when patients understood about their disease site and stage, and their smoking history also predicted their quitting. So we had some more work to do. So on this information, we, came, we began to be the noisy nutter, I suppose. We, we required executive support and ratification for our project. This was the absolute success to the implementation. And this executive support um, gave us acknowledgement of what we were doing, funds and also time allocation. We were then able to develop quick champions and these were expanded beyond nursing, so we invited all clinical areas and health professional roles to partake in our um, new learning activity. We really defined our broad stakeholders for endorsement, and we included smoking and non-smoking personnel, clinicians and non-clinicians. We included Oc Health and Safety. We contacted the Patient Advisory Committee to get them involved. We had staff union representation and Quit Victoria, and we developed our conversation of networks. And at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge the unerring support and mentorship and, and encouragement that I received from Sancho Aranda at that point, who was critical in helping us push the tobacco control agenda at Peter Mac. So then we focused our search on what would maximise our impact on patient care in providing smoking cessation support. What were the explorations and motivation to quit? Whatever we did, we realised that we had to be stigma free absolutely no blaming or laying of guilt. So we decided to put the tack on our approach to our patients by really emphasising the benefits of quitting smoking and the rewards of not smoking rather than the health effects of continue to, continuing to smoke. We strove to empower our patients to contribute to their recovery and their health. We knew from the literature that patients also quit when they feared recurrence due to smoking because they felt their smoking had caused their cancer. So there was connections that we could build on. Brief smoking interventions had to become part of routine clinical care, not just a one-off. It didn't really add value to the patient's quitting experience, although it can lead to further attempts at quitting. But then they need to be referred for more intensive support, which had to be provided at least two to three times within a month from that first intervention. So we educated our quit support champions in clinical areas who could start to ask that sensitive question of, have you ever smoked? Are you a current smoker? And do you know we actually have help here to help you quit at this hospital? We wanted to identify those who would be at greater risk of adverse health outcomes. And to ensure patients had follow-up, we developed a nurse-led smoking cessation clinic. We lobbied successfully for free pharmacological support for our patients to help them with quitting because the literature supported that notion that if you provide free quitting support for patients, they're more likely to take on the program. And then we wanted to have a look at the smoking areas within the hospital. Then we could develop <coughs> our smoking cessation strategy. We also wanted to inform the Peter Mac community of the harmful effects of tobacco smoke and highlight the benefits of quitting, specifically with a cancer diagnosis. And part of this is by denormalising the use of tobacco products. So as part of our strategy, it was to develop, sustain and research and evaluate a smoking cessation program in an acute cancer centre, provide free incentives to quit and take the hospital to be the first totally smoke-free hospital in the Melbourne metropolitan area. Barwon Health in Geelong, on the Bellarine Peninsula was the first hospital to be totally smoke free, but they did a completely different focus from an Oc Health and Safety point of view and focused on their staff and their patients weren't given any support at this point in time. We thought we could do it differently. So we were given funding to resource a nurse coordinator as a project manager with a 0.4 EFT and we worked on an annual budget. We worked on policy development for a totally smoke free hospital and we developed the guidelines for pharmacological support. So policies had to be written, guidelines had to be written, and we incorporated many people onto the team as we could who had an interest in this. We then looked at our staff globally in the hospital to see what they thought. We wanted to determine an education needs analysis and also staff perception of what our program would look like. We got a 39% response rate, that was okay, but 97% 
rated smoking cessation to be a core value at our hospital. So we thought, okay, this is good. But less than 70% actually knew the benefits of quitting with a cancer diagnosis. And over 50% made a commentary about the smoking at air entrances and egresses and little pockets around the hospital. So we needed to make the hospital smoke free. Approximately at the time of those respondents, 7% were current smokers, which at the time the smoking rate in Victoria was around 18%. And I'm pleased to say the Victorian smoking rate is now down to 13%. We also reviewed our medical records. Who was actually documenting? Who was asking patients, are you a current smoker? Would you like some help to quit? We found that in our smoking-related cancers, it varied between 35% on some records to 100% in the others. And I'm pleased to say that our lung cancer team asks the question all the time. So we identified the need for staff education and to approve our data collection regarding smoking status. So then we decided to do a pilot study. We wanted to determine how acceptable our program would be to the patients. Was it appropriate? Was it feasible? Particularly with patients with a cancer diagnosis. And luckily, and I'm pleased to say, we found that patients found the program to be acceptable. In fact, they expected that they would get some support to quit in a cancer hospital. My goodness, we're a cancer hospital. The brief intervention that we gave, and we only gave one intervention at that point, had the effect of increased motivation and confidence to quit. And when we looked at the data, um, patients actually even requested more than one session. So they actually were supporting what the literature was telling us. And then we explored what mattered to the patient. The patients who were in this small pilot study all had made a reduction in their cigarettes per day and 35% of that small group had quit at six months and we chemically validated that. Interesting, a review of the patients also who had been referred to the quit line and in this pilot study we referred them to the quit line, very few and only four out of the 40 had actually engaged with the quit line. But this was most often we found due to the demands of their treatment and they were constantly either going to the chemotherapy day unit or to the radiation bunker. And having a phone call with someone else, maybe after hours when they were tired, was just not appropriate to them. So we had to explore how best to provide this service within our hospital. We also then wanted to develop our own cancer-specific brochure, which detailed the benefits of quitting, not talking about the terrible things smoking was doing to them, but emphasising what the benefits of when you quit smoking with a cancer diagnosis actually would help you. None had been provided by Quit Victoria, so we decided to do our own. We ensured, again, that quitting medications were continually to be made available in all forms, and we expand all forms of nicotine replacement therapy, and again, continue to supply it free of charge. We also offered it now to staff. We also we were able to commence our nurse-led smoking cessation support clinic, and this actually attracted funding for episodes of care under the Victorian Ambulatory Care Classification System. So we're actually creating a little bit of revenue for the hospital. So we began seeing patients in the quit clinic, but it was actually another two years before we actually had a quit clinic. We were just in the outpatient department. We would find random spaces to have a private conversation with a patient. I used to find all sorts of places where I could have a private chat with a patient before we were actually allocated in, um, a clinical room consulting place. But we persisted. The designated smoking area. So according to the literature at the time, it was encouraging hospitals to have a single specified area where you could take smoking away from all the points of entrance and egress to the hospital, but you needed to provide a little area for people to smoke. Okay. So it was part of the literature. It was evidence-based, so we went ahead and did with it. And actually... It was very controversial. It was very expensive. It cost us $20,000 at the time and even made the Melbourne tabloid The Sun with the, evident, with the headline that cancer hospitals support smoking. I was devastated. But as I said, it was at that time evidence-based. But we deemed it to be exclusive. We wanted it to be for inpatients only, so not everybody could use it. Staff certainly couldn't use it. Visitors were not allowed to use it. It had to be for inpatients only and only palliative care patients those that were not on, anti, on active anti-cancer treatment. And they actually required a signed exemption to smoke form from their doctor. Unsurprisingly, very few doctors were prepared to sign this form. So we banned smoking everywhere else in the hospital. We even had smoking on our lovely little balcony outside our operating room, so when you wheeled a patient to theatre, the waft of smoking came from the balcony. So we banned smoking everywhere else. 
and we wanted to provide that safe environment for staff and patients. We also wanted to minimise the risk of fire risk from smoking in bathrooms and stairwells. So, as again I said, it was evidence-based. But we also had to minimise um, environmental tobacco smoke and the cost was more in the airlocks and the air curtains that were required. However, only 14 patients used it in the year, so we closed it without fanfare and without complaint within a year. Thank goodness. So we did a policy rewrite then. We clearly articulated that we were now an absolutely smoke-free hospital and staff and patients who choose to smoke were now requested to leave the hospital precinct. We suggested to patients that they accepted their own responsibility if they left the hospital and we actually had this checked by our hospital lawyers. They were not to be accompanied by staff and as compassionate as a person might feel, they were not to wheel the patient out for a cigarette. Staff are discouraged to smoke with or in front of patients and we actually even asked staff to de-identify themselves if they chose to go outside the hospital to smoke in a public space. And this was a voluntary implementation. We were not to be punitive about it. <clears throat> so Melbourne City Council even became engaged with this as well, and we asked them to put up signs on the parking metre signs to say that we were now a smoke-free precinct. Um, and we specified that this smoke-free um, hospital was known to everybody. We included it at orientation and we actively encouraged staff to quit and also self-refer for confidential counselling. We had really clear delineation of boundaries, large metal posters all around the hospital and all points of access we had banners, footpaths painted. It was a smoke-free hospital. Patients who smoke on the property are actually approached and just informed you probably may not know this is a smoke-free area. If you choose to smoke, you must leave this area or you can put out your cigarette and you can stay here. And all staff are responsible to enact this policy. More signs, this again, closer one. Occasionally the do not smoke is um, obliterated, then we would clean up the poster again. You have to be persistent. So our education strategy, we were called for more quit champions across the hospital who were actually trained in smoking cessation strategies. We ran education strategies at the hospital and through Quit Victoria. We presented at every forum and presentation we could get our hand in. All clinical streams, multidisciplinary, non-clinical groups. We did grand round presentations. We accessed the GP community and presented to them, to the patient advisory committee and presented to them. We invited medical students and all, all forms of health professional students to work in our clinic and they did placements and assessments in, of interviewing in our clinic. It was then time to do a greater study. So we did a prospective study. And the primary aim was to determine our prolonged abstinence rates after smoking cessation at 12 months post-delivery. We had secondary aims as well. We wanted to look at the prolonged abstinence rates at one, three and six months, the point prevalence at these points in time, that is not smoking within seven days of when we asked the patient. We also wanted to compare the quality of life and distress scores in quitters and non-quitters. We were asking patients to quit at a time which was emotionally tumultuous for them. Were we doing them any favours? So we used validated instruments such as the distress thermometer and the smoking cessation quality of life questionnaires. And we also wanted to determine the patient associations between patient and treatment factors and prolonged abstinence. So it was actually quite difficult to recruit to our study. We had very tight criteria, but we managed to enrol 77 patients over two years. And we had a median age of 56. The age range was as young as 27 to 71, and more than half were male. Just over half had a smoking-related cancer, and a third were living with another smoker. These were important factors. The mean age to start smoking amongst our group was 16, and it varied from as early as seven years of age to 25. We found that the cancer population were a much more nicotine dependent and had a much stronger lifelong history of smoking than the average Victorian smoker. Nearly a quarter had considered quitting or even cutting down by the first intervention and over half were already planning to quit. So any patients with missing data was presumed to be still smoking and all patients not quit we found had cut down how much they were smoking and had quit and restarted several times during the follow-up. 
This is very normal for a quitter. They will relapse and try again, relapse and try again. So it's always important to continually ask the question. The point prevalence rate at 12 months was 36%. We were really pleased with that. These are patients who had not smoked within seven days of the, prior, of the time prior to the end point. And 24% of our patients had actually quit for the long term, for 12 months after attending the smoking, smoking cessation program. The interesting point too is that all those who had quit had decreased stress scores and improved quality of life. This was their own perception, so we were, well, we were on a good thing. So engaging in an active quit plan at the first intervention was also a significant factor. If they had been admitted to hospital with a, a treatment toxicity, that also influenced their condition to quit and having a smoking related cancer. And unsurprisingly, there was actually no association with their level of nicotine dependence. We thought that would have a big bearing on them. And also their baseline distress or quality of life scores. Whether or not they used nicotine replacement therapy didn't make a difference, or the efficacy of their cancer treatment. So there were other things that were going on. So when we announced that we were totally smoke-free in 2007, we were able to implement a successful patient-centred smoking cessation strategy. We were also determined that we would become, as a hospital, smoke-free before the hotels and clubs and bars in Victoria were. I was so determined we were. We wanted to demonstrate clear leadership in cancer prevention and a public health message as well. We also made a policy rewrite again, and we reiterated it was a voluntary compliance, and we also got senior clinician engagement. We had lots of communication strategies, as I've mentioned before, but we used the World No Tobacco Day as a day of launching. This announcement on specific dates really takes the message to the core. We again reviewed our totally smoke-free brochure. Our previous one had been towards a smoke-free hospital. Now we were a smoke-free hospital. We did web alerts and grand rounds and media releases and we were able to get signatures on the emails as well. And these are our totally smoke-free brochure at the bottom there. It's with the effects of smoking which I'm not really fond of that sign, but quitting smoking is pretty good. The next thing we needed to do was to ensure that every patient was now being asked routinely as part of their care of, are you a smoker? Are you a current smoker? And would you like some help to quit? This data collection of smoking and identifica identification of smokers continues to be an area of neglect in healthcare. There are too few hospitals who ask this as part of routine care. So we had a lot of discussion how best this, this could be done. How could we capture every patient that comes through our door, whether or not we're asking the question? So we decided that every patient gets registered. They all have to go through admissions at some point to get a UR number. This is a good point of capture. So we instituted that all new patients registered since 2009 would be asked about their smoking status when they were newly registered. We trained the medical record staff, the administration staff, how to ask the question sensitively, and they were already asking sensitive questions around indigeneity, around their marital status, their religion, so we tapped on that quality that they were using. This information now translates to the medical record and acts as a prompt for health professionals to advise smokers of the benefits of quitting again with a cancer diagnosis, and then it requests that they refer them to smoking cessation support. It also provides invaluable data on smoking status for research. By now, we had had consulting room space for a year and our referrals started to increase from 46 patients in 2006 to 152 in 2009. We then conducted another pharmacy-led study, so we were getting more multidisciplinary involvement in our um, smoking cessation and tobacco-free team. So after two years of data collection at registration, we conducted a multidisciplinary study with our pharmacy department and examined a rep retrospective single arm of 312 patients who had been seen in our smoking cessation clinic. And we compared this to our registration data that we could pull up and we examined the tobacco dependence in pack years and quit rates after the smoking cessation intervention. Of all the registered patients, 50% had disclosed that they had smoked in the past and 12% stated that they were current smokers. However, of those who had been disclosed at registration and was on their electronic record, only 7% had actually been referred to our clinic. This study confirmed our previous data that our program was um, effective with 
25% of the patients that we examined had been quit for long term, that is greater than 12 months, and again a point prevalence of 36, th sorry, 33% in smoke, not smoking in the week prior to the 12 months. And many had made a reduction even if they had not quit. Of note, we found that 43% of patients that actually had attended our clinic didn't disclose their smoking history at the registration. So the above rates are possibly underestimates. However, this means that we also need have, to have ongoing opportunity in our clinical care to continue to repeatedly ask the question of, do you or have you ever smoked and would you like some help to quit and we can help you. Our team of our tobacco-free strategy at Peter Mac has had some other really significant leaders as well. One of our radiation oncologists, Dr Bronwyn King, who is a key member of our tobacco-free strategy at Peter Mac, has just been announced of one of Australia's 2014 100 Women of Influence. Now, her work has been in encouraging Australia's superannuation industry to divest stocks in tobacco companies. Since 2011, 17 large Australian superannuation funds have divested tobacco stocks worth more of a total than $1.2 billion. Roman is presently engaged with more than 30 other funds as well, as well as asset consultants and banks, and encouraging them to reconsider their tobacco holdings. Roman could not bear the fact that she was actually gaining investment on her super fund with tobacco um, investments. She gave business case presentations and identified conflicts of interest. And subsequently, we now have a smoke-free um, superannuation um, fund that we can offer all of our staff and agreements to offer tobacco-free policy folios. And she continues her pressures to all super fund CFOs until all socially responsible tobacco options are made available. So two years ago, Peter Mac also became a key member of the Victorian network for smoke-free hospitals. This is based on the European model of the um, smoke-free hospitals. And this shares and supports assistance to other hospitals which, which are desiring to become smoke-free and also other health services. We all advise on issues of compliance, smoking cessation strategies, education of the community and engaging key stakeholders, who matters and how they can help. We also endeavour to maintain that there was a prohibition of funding or sponsorship or representation of the tobacco industry. And we've had the odd hiccup, but we've persisted. And to date, there is absolutely no conflict of interest within the Peter Mac community with this, within this regard. VNSH has been also a key pressure group for smoke-free health services legislation through the Victorian government. And I'm very pleased to say that our pressure has um, allowed and permitted that there will now be a smoking ban in April 2015 for all health services in Victoria. And that means that all hospitals has to now be smoke free and there's going to be a four metre um, area of compliance around all public hospitals and registered community centres. This is a minimum standard. We actually state 50 metres on our, on our signs. Again, the focus is on education rather than policing. There is always more on the agenda. And as Carrie stated, we need to know how good we are today. We need to continue to contribute to the writing and the compliance of the VNSH standards. We have a now a planned review of our staff survey. We are in the process of now developing a multidisciplinary study in conjunction with the University of Melbourne regarding our pre-anesthetic um, clinic. And this is currently under view. And today is actually World Anesthesia Day with a focus on, does your anesthetist know that you smoke? We have posters everywhere in the clinic. We are yet to engage with the Victorian Centre of Cancer Care or the VCCC plans regarding the Royal Melbourne and the Royal Women's Hospital. I'm not sure if you realise our hospital is going to relocate to a hospital precinct near the University of Melbourne and the Royal Women's and the Royal Melbourne Hospital are not yet totally smoke-free hospitals. So we have a continuity to develop our smoke-free Peter Mac values within this new precinct. We are examining the poss possibility of automated referrals from our registration data. data. I'm not sure how we're going to cope with the volume, but I'm ready up for the challenge. And we also are actively exploring how to engage with our Indigenous community within Peter Mac. And our smoking cessation nurses are liaising with the Victorian Aboriginal community controlled health organisations to look at their expertise in tobacco control in Indigenous populations, where up to 70% of our Indigenous people are continuing to smoke. So what have been our success factors? 
strong executive support. This has been critical. And yes, I have waited for the bus to come and go with executives and who will help and who doesn't help. And then I represent my case again to the next executive that comes and maintain the funding that we have for our service. They give us financial, practical, OCH health support and policy writing strategies. Our focus is to maintain a patient-centred approach. Does the patient find this acceptable? Do they find our approach acceptable? Do we discuss making cessation that maintains the values of dignity, compassion and, and respect? We ensure that clean, senior clinicians are in, uh, engaged at stakeholdership. This appeals to their area of expertise and in their network connections. It took me three years to get smoking asked at registration and finally I got some very keen clinicians who were professors who were on the, on the ball and helped me to drive this through. We need to maintain a research practice and encourage a multidisciplinary view and a multi-focused view of who we can help within our community. You need to maintain a high profile. You need to be a dog with a bone. You need to ensure that a smoking cessation education is, is maintain, program is maintained within your health service and tap into the key areas. You have a New South Wales Cancer Council, I'm sure they can help you there too. And maintain con continuous communication. Seek opportunities. So a, a smoking cessation strategy is really as easy as ABCD. We need to continually ask the question. Establish mechanisms within your service that prompts all staff to ask patients about their smoking status and encouraging them to quit and giving them an opportunity to assist with quitting. Educate your staff to give brief advice to quit smoking and develop strategies that prompt this discourse with your patients. Encourage staff to refer patients who smoke to treatment specialists, smoking cessation specialists, which ideally is offered as a core value to your health service and maintains a patient focus. Create a policy that is evidence-based. Look to the literature within an ethical framework and document all your interventions. This also includes the researching and evaluating your service to patients and continue to be a disruptive innovator. And as quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, the New South Wales Cancer Council published in the Journal of Oncology that when a person quits smoking, even when diagnosed with a lung cancer diagnosis, they will gain nearly two years in survival time by the time they reach five years after diagnosis. It's worth the effort. Thank you very much.